Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm starting on time today because I have a, uh, we have a long introduction and people generally start coming in around five after two. So uh, that's fine, but, we, but I will begin. I'm Elizabeth Sackler and I would like to welcome you to part two of our spring series of States of Denial, the illegal incarceration of women, children, and people of color. Um, <laughs> I don't know why, but I wrote this lighthearted limerick this morning to begin a very serious afternoon um, on the second day of spring, and it's still cold. Here at the Brooklyn Museum, bringing art to the world to be see em, and with states of denial and all of its guile, we seek justice that sure ain't plebeium. <laughs> um, all our programming of states of denial is very close to the bone. We have brought in Attica then and now. We've had women come in and talk about how they birthed in shackles. And we've heard the horrors of juvenile imprisonment and more. In one year, actually, we have brought in uh, seven <coughs> programs, which is almost 20 hours of public discussions about the truths of incarceration and the absolute necessity to fight the strategically built system of mass incarceration that disenfranchises and, as we know, permanently eliminates entire populations across this country. <coughs> Schools have become feeders to prisons. Children are sentenced to life without parole. They will grow up, they will grow old, and they will die in prison. And people of conscience, both uh, political prisoners and others, uh, are political prisoners, and others are disappeared. And all of this is a multi-billion dollar business, and this must stop. All our programs are online, so please tell your friends and other people who want to learn or people you know who ought to learn about what's going on in our front and backyards, and it is going on in our front and backyards. If you go to www.brooklynmuseum.org slash E-A-S-C-F-A slash video, you will see all of our programs uh, over the last year. And what you will see right now, and I'm very proud of it, is that the entire video homepage of the Sackler Center website is all states of denial programming. And I think that's really important. So if you are a member of an organization, um, these programs will assist you in fundraising, they will assist you in friend raising, and they will certainly assist you in consciousness raising. So I invite you, please, to check it out. Um, this is a very formidable museum, an encyclopedic museum. And um, I thank this museum and the board because I have the opportunity to educate our communities uh, about injustice, injustice that is beyond the pale. It is the intersection of art and activism that is so potent here at the Brooklyn Museum. Malcolm Gladwell wrote in his book, David and Goliath, and I quote, the excessive use of force creates legitimacy problems, and force without legitimacy leads to defiance, not submission. We will begin today's program with a short but very powerful work of art, a seven minute film called The Black Panthers Revisited that I saw on the Times website by filmmaker in 2002, MacArthur uh, Genius Award, Stanley Nelson. And Stanley's credits are long and very important and I'm gonna save the outstanding bio for an autumn program when I hope we will be hosting him and screening his full length film the Black Panthers' vanguard of the revolution, which was this year an official selection uh, at the Sundance Film Festival and will be released this coming fall. 
I chose uh, Gladwell's quote and Nelson's film to set the stage for Susan Rosenberg. So please join me uh, in watching Stanley Nelson's The Black Panthers Revisited. The stories in the news today remind me of the sentiments of almost 50 years ago, when many young black people felt that policing for them was unfair. During that time period, being black in America meant that you didn't walk down the street with the same sense of safety and the same sense of privilege as a white person. There was absolutely no difference in the way the police treated us in, in Mississippi than they did in California. They may not have called you nigger every day, but they treated you the same way they did in Mississippi. The police jump on you, beat you up, put the gun at your head. This is what we were going through on a daily basis. I'm tired of it. I'll stay here as long as I have to. Now, as then, the need for change is real. Nearly every black man I know has a story about an encounter with the police. I myself have been stopped, searched, and had a gun put to my head for no rational reason. There, there, there. One response to police brutality in 1966 was the founding of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. We use the uh, Black Panther as our symbol because of the nature of a panther. A panther doesn't strike anyone, but uh, when he's assailed upon, that he'll back up first. But if the aggressor continues, then he'll strike out. When I first met Hugh and Bobby, they were uh, in the process of forming an organization for uh, primarily self-defense. We didn't plan to have a nationwide organization or anything like that. We were organizing, dealing with the problems in Oakland. In 1966, California law allowed civilians to carry loaded weapons as long as they were not concealed, as do many states today. And the newly formed Black Panther Party took advantage of the law. The uh, California Penal Code Section 12020 through 12027 and also the Second Amendment of the Constitution guarantees the citizen a right to bear arms on public property. Huey said we're going to carry our guns and we're going to follow the police and if they stop someone, we're going to stop, we're going to maintain a legal distance and we're going to observe the so-called officers in the performance of their duty. We're coming around the corner, uh, just stay facing the way you are. We would stop, we would get out of the cars, we would walk up to the scene. Those who had rifles would carry them in the open, uh, clearly visible. We would stand at a, um, a distance where the police couldn't say they were interfering with their arrest or their detention of the individual and uh, make sure that uh, there was no brutality. The police were confronted by citizens who were not just voicing their opinions, but were armed. They would uh, take the weapon and pass it across like this, and it would sweep past, right over the officer. No one would do anything until a policeman ejected around in the chamber. Then we would all eject rounds in the chamber. And all up and down the street, you could hear this clack, 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 clack. And then when the traffic stopper, the incident's over, they bring the weapon down across by you like this and get back in their car and drive off. It was very, pretty intimidating. The Black Panther Party spread quickly, partly because young African Americans across the country had similar experiences with the police. We would get calls from Atlanta, Nashville, Raleigh, North Carolina, from Washington, D.C., Bridgeport, Connecticut. Every city, small or large you can think of, wanted a chapter of the Black Panther Party. 
There's no question that the Panthers were provocative. But there's also no question that law enforcement exaggerated the threat they posed and overreacted. Do you feel the nation is in trouble? I think very definitely it is. Well, what is the answer? The answer is vigorous law enforcement. That's the only answer? That's the only answer. How about justice? You hear a lot about justice with law enforcement. Justice is merely incidental to law and order. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover today asserted that the Black Panthers represent the greatest internal threat to the nation. Hoover said the Panthers have perpetrated numerous assaults on police and have engaged in violent confrontations throughout the country. When Hoover identified the Black Panther Party as the number one threat to the uh, national security of the United States at a time when they're fighting in, in Vietnam, you know, of course that was crazy, but it was politically very effective. And it says to law enforcement at the local level, we can take the gloves off now. We don't have to respect the civil liberties, and, and we can go after them with everything we got. Police say there was sniper fire throughout the early morning hours, so they moved in cautiously. Police and, and then Black began Panthers to... clash in Houston, New Orleans, and other cities. The Black Panther police shoot out. In the three dawn hours minutes. in Chicago today, police and Negroes fought a pitched battle. Obviously, we are nowhere near this today. In fact, we may be at a transformative moment. People of all ages and races are recognizing the problems with policing in black communities and are protesting. Now, there is a chance for real change. But police departments and political leaders must not overreact as they did 50 years ago. They need to listen. When I say no, you say violence. No. Violence. No. Violence. When I say no, you say violence. No. Violence. No. Violence. No justice. No peace. school in 1966 and I remember it well and the only disagreement I have here is that the police didn't overreact the police did exactly what the FBI wanted them to which is to take out the Black Panthers and it was a sad day but we are here today, and we are here together. And I guess I'm here in hope. I'm delighted to introduce the program, Prison Women and Change, with Susan Rosenberg, political prisoner turned writer and teacher, and Nagedshi Taifa, senior po policy analyst with the Open Society. Together, they will tackle how movements for change and justice have developed over the last 25 years, what women's leadership has meant for prison, the prison movement, and how mass incarceration has continued the long history of racism in American life. Susan's bio, Susan is a human rights and prisoners' rights advocate, lecturer, consultant, award-winning writer, speaker, and a formerly incarcerated person. Her memoir, An American Radical, which there are a few copies here and are for sale, and I uh, encourage you to purchase it. Uh, details her 16 years in federal prison. She was released from prison in 2001 through an executive clemency by the then President Bill Clinton. Upon her release, she worked at the American Jewish World Service for 12 years as a writer and then director of, the, of communications. Post AJWS, Susan worked in the, uh, with the NGOs focused on human rights she is founder of Sync It Communications, focused on international human rights and criminal justice. She is an adjunct lecturer at Hunter College, a member of the Prison Writing Committee of PEN America, and Susan has spoken widely on prison issues and is currently uh, at work on another book. 
Negechi Taifa is a native Washingtonian. I haven't met many native Washingtonians. We're kind of unusual breeds. I'm a native New Yorker, so this is kind of, and is a social justice attorney, activist, author, who serves uh, a senior policy award analyst as, as a senior policy award anal, uh, policy analyst, excuse me, for civil and criminal justice reform at the Open Society Foundation to advance federal criminal justice policy reform. She was found, the founding director of the Howard University School of Law's award-winning Equal Justice Program and adjunct professor at Howard Law and American University College of Law. As a private practitioner, she represented adult and juvenile clients before the Superior Court of the District of Columbia and has written and spoken extensively on issues of civil and human rights and criminal and civil justice reform. She received her Juris Doctorate from George Washington University Law School and a BA from Howard University. And before inviting our speakers to join me on the stage, uh, I'm gonna take a few minutes to read from An American Radical, Susan's book. Mid-book, Susan cites the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, Article 5. Quote, no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. She then continues mid-chapter. Step out, they ordered. I was handcuffed and told, spread. This meant facing the wall and stretching out my arms and legs. I was patted down and told to stand next to the door. Four of them went in. They searched every single thing. They unscrewed the light bulbs. They climbed on the top bunk and looked at the windowsill. And they went through every legal and personal paper one by one. They dragged the mattress onto the tier. They took the shampoo and talcum powder and poured them on the mattress. They scooped, they took scooped peanut butter from an old jar and smeared it on my personal photographs. They uncuffed me, put me back inside, shut the door and repeated the process in every cell down the line. Everyone was yelling. In the cells that hadn't been hit yet, women were standing and watching. The violence seemed to increase with each cell. And then they got to the last three cells. They popped open the door and one of them roared, step out. The woman inside was brushing her teeth. One of them stepped in and grabbed her. She spit out her mouth full of toothpaste and saliva on him. If they had waited 10 seconds more, she would have stepped out on her own. But she was disobeying orders. So four of them began to beat her up, with all the rest of us watching. This small woman fought back. Everyone was hollering and throwing things out of their windows. An egg went flying and hit one of the guards. Four of them dragged that woman up the stairs and into the entrance of the block. The cops had bloodlust in their eyes. In the hall, they couldn't get the cuffs onto her. Her fury matched theirs. Eventually, they overpowered her and carried her off. I had never seen that level of brutality directed against a woman. We were all crying from anger, frustration, and fear. And yet, in the DC jail, it was almost normal. It was not extreme, a little more brutal than usual, but only a little. To administer by fear and control by terror was a tactic that was understood by the prisoners. It was a natural way of life inside or outside. I cried because I didn't know how to resist that level of dehumanization. Please join me in welcoming Susan Rosenberg. and Negechi Taifa. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth Sackler. Uh, I really loved the way you opened up and really loved the uh, clip that you showed uh, from the upcoming film dealing with Black Panther's vanguard of the 
uh, of the party. I really want to thank the Elizabeth Sackler uh, Center for Fem Feminist uh, Art here at the Brooklyn Museum and for this series, this phenomenal series that really brings to the public um, very, very important issues and people's so Susan, it's so been a long time. I know. I mean, it really has been nearly 30 years, really about 28 years when we, we first met yep. at the DC jail, I would say, and uh, you in an orange jumpsuit and chains and shackles and me as part of the legal uh, defense team. But I just want to go back a little bit if I can. Just what is it that will bring a Susan Rosenberg <laughs> to the DC jail, to Lexington, to Mariana, to Danbury. What is it that motivated you, that inspired you, that um, uh, politicized you to take on this whole uh, life of activism that you have uh, been a part of? Always, that's always the first question, right? So, um, you know, I, I answer it differently in different times because I lived and grew up in a time that there was so much going on that could motivate one to become an activist and a revolutionary. Um, I think, you know, I, I grew up in New York, as Elizabeth was talking about, in a very, in a moment, a unique moment of uh, sort of liberalism. There was the war in Vietnam. My parents were uh, very liberal. They were Democrats, um, and uh, they were actually left of, of being, you know, Democrats, they were progressive, there was the anti-nuclear movement, there were all kinds of things. The 50s had ended and the 60s began and there was this big uh, opening in the society and there was worldwide social struggle. So I was really, I grew up in that time and was very impacted by a lot of things. But, you know, why, I don't know, when I was a little child, I, I felt people suffering and I really experienced and I had an empathy about that kind of suffering. So when I was really little, you know, I would see people in the New York City who were in poverty and I would be completely freaked out by that. And, uh, you know, I think kind of one sensitivity about injustice led me to another um, and the times meshed with that. So uh, I was in high school during um, the Panther 21 trial, the New York City Panther 21 trial, which was this really major political trial that I'm sure is in the film in some way. Um, and I was 15 and I went to the courthouse it, during this trial and there were sharpshooters all around the courthouse. And you know, it was kind of looking at what the government could do and was doing. Uh, and so there were a lot, of, a lot of things that motivated me. The war in Vietnam, I think, was another really critical thing that many of us responded to. We were watching our government destroy people on television with napalm. And you know, this is not new. People who've been talking about the 60s have talked about this already. But it, it, you know, it just penetrated uh, my entire being. Uh, you know, Susan, I understand that you went to school with a brother of James Cheney, one of the three uh, civil rights workers who were uh, murdered in Mississippi. Um, that school, I mean, it's, it, tell us a little bit about that and whether that had anything to do with the shaping of your political consciousness and this whole sensitivity totally. towards injustice that you Totally, speaking. yes, it did. I mean, I went to a school that was called Walden, uh, like, you know, the pond, and um, it was a progressive school, and uh, it was very involved in the community at that time. It was in New York on the Upper West Side, and um, uh, Andrew Goodman, who was one of the civil rights workers who was killed in Mississippi in 1964, had been a student there, and his family, his brother was in the school, a younger brother who was still in the school, and when he was killed in Mississippi in 64, I was in that school, and um, it had a huge, enormous impact that somebody that I knew had taken an act of solidarity with the black movement at that time and had suffered the ultimate consequences for that, and it, it absolutely impacted all of us. And I think then, 
what, what happened was a complicated thing that raises a lot of things about racism and the North versus the South. But the school banded together uh, and the board of the school and they did a big fundraising campaign and brought um, James Cheney and uh, Mrs. Cheney who were the, one, the and I'm sure now I can't remember his brother's name, who, one of the civil rights workers who was slain with Andrew Goodman uh, to come to live in New York. And they had been in Mississippi. They were from Mississippi. And so his brother became a very good friend of mine. And watching his experience of being brought from the South to the North you know, where this whole traumatic situation had just been occurring with their lives and their family in Mississippi had a very big impact, I think. And what happened with Ben Cheney, I'm sorry, I couldn't sorry. read Ben Cheney. Um, ben Cheney went on and actually also joined the Black Panther Party when we were in high school. So one thing kind of really led to another. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we both were uh, born really around the time of the mid 50s, um, I should say, and I just recall very vividly looking in the library of my parents' den. There was this book called A Pictorial History of the Negro in America, and I saw a picture there of a young black boy, 14 years old, who had been from Chicago, who was in Mississippi visiting relatives, and he was found at the bottom of Mississippi's Tallahatchie River. His name was uh, Emmett Till, and it was that image that really uh, left an indelible print on my mind in terms of injustice in society and that it was not a very long time ago. It was during my lifetime. And I'm just wondering from your specific heritage and ethnic um, background and the like, uh, I remember reading in your book, you, I don't know if it was your grandmother or some elder's arm you saw with some marks and mm -hmm. you were very young at the time and you questioned her about it. Can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, I, 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 I grew up in a Jewish household, and while my parents were from, had been born in the U.S., other people in my family had been impacted by the Holocaust. And uh, so I grew up with a consciousness about people's, people being attacked for who they are and, you know, what the role of genocide was in the, in the Jewish, in the history of Jewish people uh, over the 20th century. And so I had that frame of reference um, and, um, and knew about that. And, you know, while it wasn't the main thing, I, it did, I think, from an early time, uh, inculcate a sense of, of anger and, and fury at injustice of, of, all, of all types. But it also was a, a, a way then for me to understand racism in the United States. And so the experience that I knew about and, and had sort of uh, in a secondhand way in my family really did frame things. And later when I was in prison, you know, the, the whole, I, I, I spent some time in, uh, in a control unit, which I'm sure we'll talk a little more about, but I, uh, I did have access to some books during that period. And while I was in this uh, control unit, experimental unit, I read a lot of history of the Holocaust. I discovered Primo Levi, who just completely changed my life and my thinking about uh, the, the Second World War, genocide, the role that people play in their own oppression and repression. So um, I, had a, I have a lot of connection to, to that. Mm -hmm. um, before we get to Lexington yeah, yeah. and prison, I'm, I'm still exploring um, some of your background um, and the like and uh, maybe connections to now. I know when I was a youth growing up, um, it wasn't uncommon to walk down the street and at the bus stop, because there were no metros, at least in Washington, D.C. In, in those days, at the bus stop, seeing someone standing there with a copy of the autobiography of Malcolm X under their arm or Man, Child, in the Promised Land or something along those lines. There was, there was a lot of consciousness of the youth. I'm talking about teenagers um, at that time. Did you see anything similar from your growing up during the 60s? And if so, or if not, what similarities or differences do you see with the youth of today versus the youth of yesterday and the issues of today vis-a-vis -vis the issues of mm -hmm. yesterday? Mm -hmm. 
Well, yeah, I saw the same thing that you saw, I mean, in New York City. People were, I mean, there really was this major movement going on that was a social and political and cultural movement that affected everybody. Uh, so I remember when Manchild and the Promised Land came out. You know, that was an amazing book, and people were reading it. Um, Columbia, I lived in New York, and the student strike and the student struggles that were going on at Columbia University and at NYU impacted people who lived in this city, you know, it impacted me as a high school anti-war activist. So uh, people were, uh, there was a, a an explosion of, 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 of liberation impulses, liberatory impulses from all over the society and all over the world. So yeah, it was a very amazing kind of time. It was also a time when there was the backlash and the real intensification of US imperialism, right? So there was um, the coup in Chile, there was what happened in Iran, there was um, uh, ongoingly stuff that was going on with the Vietnam War. There was African liberation struggles beginning to uh, to expand, you know, with, throughout Africa. So all of that um, could be felt in the street. It wasn't it wasn't some abstraction. It was like right it was like right next to you. So um, I think that there, because it was a movement and people could join something and there were organizations and there was ideas, a, f a very expansive set of ideas um, that were engaging people, uh, there was a practice that evolved of, of radical activism. And in that sense, I don't, I, it, it's been a slow, it's been a slow move from, from what happened as, as a result of the defeats of those movements and the setbacks and the changes globally, I think, to now where we are seeing again, we're beginning to see this and it's totally exciting. It's, a, it's a, you know, I teach at Hunter and um, we are doing a class in, in memoir and um, people in my class are reading Malcolm X you know, as one of the possible readings for this class. And they have not read Malcolm X before. Or they're reading Asada Shakur. They haven't read her book. Uh, they're reading Safiya Bukhari. They're reading the, you know, the memoirs and the writings now of people who wrote from their experiences mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And I think, you know, as it showed in the film, um, Black Lives Matter is, is, there is something about, and I agree with Elizabeth, um, I think the police are the state police, they're the political police, and that's what they do, and that's what they're supposed to do. And they've been doing it all along. You know, there's a study by the MXG, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, that has done a whole analysis of police and the role of police, and there's a black person killed every 28 hours in this country by police forces or paramilitary or other kind of state forces. That's an amazingly uh, horrible number. So yes, I think there is a, a similarity. I, I think it's a harder time mm -hmm. because the, the contradictions in the world are so much more complicated and mm -hmm. harder to understand. But people are furious. Mm -hmm. Just watching the clip with the juxtaposition of the Black Lives Matter movement um, juxtaposed against the Black Panther Party movement of the past uh, really shows that we're talking about a, a continuum. You know, the struggle continues, as the mantra we used to say, right. uh, yeah. you know, back in the day. Um, something happened, though, to stop that growing movement, at least for a long while. I know drugs were poured into the communities and um, the, the music was not quite as conscious as it was in the past. I know the, the FBI had a one secret illegal program called the COINTELPRO, where one of their goals was to stop the long range growth of militant black nationalist organizations, especially among the youth, and it said the specific targets, uh, specific tactics uh, would be devised to stop that uh, growth. So when I saw and see what's happening today with Black Lives Matter, when I just heard over the 
um, uh, email not too long ago that there was going to be a meeting of the minds and, and, and sessions between veterans from the past, from the movements of the past, and the new growing movement among the youth today. Um, it made me feel uh, inspired. And you know, you were one of those veterans of the past, uh, Susan. And your book, um, An American Rad Radical. Um, That's it. Yeah, An American Radical Political Prisoner in My Own Country. Your book has been described as moving, as riveting, as mesmerizing, as terrifying, as uh, harrowing, as powerful. It's been described in, in all of those uh, ways, rightfully so. And I recall your book starts with uh, you being on the New Jersey uh, Turnpike in a 20-foot U-Haul truck with I don't know how many hundreds of pounds or whatever of, of, of weapons and, and um, explosives. Tell us your story. <laughs> Talk you, to us. You, what is you, your story? <laughs> well, you know, that's part of why I wrote the book. So I just want to answer that. But I, yeah, my story. Well, it, okay. I'll, I, I think, it, take you know, a deep breath. take a deep breath. Yeah, I know I will. Um, you know, there, there's a lot to everybody's story, and there's a lot to my story. I think it's, you know, what, what is the moment, the break with saying that the, that the current status quo cannot stay the same and that one must take action in your life to make that change? And it's different at different times for different people. Um, but I reached that point in my life where I made a decision to say, I'm going to join a revolutionary movement for revolutionary change. That's what I believed in. That's what I thought was gonna happen in this country. And I wasn't that different than many, many thousands of people at this, in this current, in that period of time. And there was a war that was going on and you referred to it as the counterintelligence program. We didn't exactly know what was going on, but it, it, we experienced it that way. And by the time I was in my early 20s, I was involved with people who were in the Black Panther Party and in the Young Lords Party and who were fighting for community control of health care in the Bronx and in other places and being involved in the anti-war movement. And so there were, there were all of these um, struggles that were very serious and very radical about trying to take power, trying to challenge the society at its roots, right? Radical, that's what it means. So um, I think, you know, kind of one thing led me to another, and I got involved with and supported Black Panthers who wanted to wage a uh, 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 self-defense, but to organize and, and create the capacity to fight the state, you know, to really do that. And so um, I joined organizations that supported that and, and worked toward that. And in, uh, I was indicted in a case that I talk about in my book uh, that's a very, uh, still a very prominent and awful case in New York State. Um, and uh, I, I, I decided not to go to trial in that case. I didn't feel that it would be uh, advantageous for me. And because I was already leaning in the direction to say I'm not going to support the status quo in any way, I went underground at that time. And what does that mean, go underground? What do you well, it, it doesn't mean the subway, which is <laughs> something that you know people really think. Um, uh, it, it means taking, uh, like, taking your life away from the public. It means literally changing your identity. It means adopting another identity. It, but really, more importantly than that, what it means is it says, it's trying to say, we were trying to say that you can't only work in the public to make change, right? You have to be able to move away from the surveillance state if you're going to be able to organize, right? Because that's what we were really trying to do. And that's part of why I think it's so much harder now, mm -hmm. is because the level of we live with a technology that makes radical politics a, a, a really very public, no matter what you do. 
Um, so being underground, but part of it, and I, I talk about this in my book, being underground, by the time I went underground, which was late in the in this period of radicalism and, and social movements, um, we were very isolated. It, we were very small in number, and we had very little resources. And so we were very, like, we really were isolated in, in our little apartments doing our little illegal work that we were doing. And, you know, part of why you join a social movement is because you want to make change because of your humanity, because you want to engage with humanity and organize. And being underground was the absolute antithesis of that. So it was very difficult to be underground because it was, on the one hand, what one believed you should be doing, but on the other, it was very counter to being with people. Mm -hmm. So being underground was very challenging, very well, hard. I, I think I remember this from your book. It really was the antithesis of what you were. I mean, you were Susan Rosenberg. You had your particular look. You had your particular style. You had your particular <laughs> stance, et cetera, right, et cetera. That's right, but that's right. my understanding from your book is that when you're underground, you really have to be quote unquote normal, fit in, look like everyone else right. Um, right. look like someone and act like someone who you're not. How, how do you survive that m mentally and psychologically? And how long were you underground? It, it's hard to do. I, it's, I, it, I mean, I, I, I was underground for uh, almost three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a long time of being away from your life, your family, your friends, etc. But I was doing it because I believed that it was the right thing to do politically. I believed that I was part of a movement of people that were going to make a revolution. And I mean, one of the things that I think happens when you're in that situation is there's a group think. There's like a mind think that happens that perpetuates a view of the world that you're in that may not actually be true. And I, I think that that was something that did happen to us, that we really misread what was going on by the time we were still engaged in that level of radical politics. And, you know, I, I, I don't defend everything that we did or um, support everything that we did then, but we were... We, our intentions and our, our view of that, our desires were, were I think, legitimate. Okay, so you were arrested. Um, tell us about that experience. And I also want to hear about your incarceration, your incarceration as a woman, your incarceration as a white woman, your incarceration as a revolutionary. All those categories were part of you. Were the differences or similarities in how you were treated while incarcerated in those various categories? Tell us just a little bit about that experience. Not getting into Lexington yet, but just generally speaking. I want to talk about Lexington. If we're going to get there. <laughs> um, uh, well, yeah, I think, yeah. Well, I say this, prison, the experience of going to prison, of getting captured, of going on trial, um, was, uh, you know, in some ways, because I had been involved with radical people much of my, uh, my, uh, my life up to that point, I thought I was prepared. I thought I was ready. I would know what was going to happen to me in prison. And uh, actually, prison and the experience of being in the hands of the state and being hated so deeply by the state for being primarily a race trader, which was what my jacket was when I was in prison, um, really blew my mind. Prison blew my mind in, in every way. Excuse and me, did you say it said race trader? Yes. On your jacket? On your it, didn't, it didn't say that. Oh, okay, right? I'm, it so didn't, I'm sorry. I it's okay. To... No, it didn't literally <laughs> say that, but <laughs> I I, and I want to come back and talk about No, it didn't it's literally all say I that. Just, I'm yeah. sorry, I no, was, no. you know. <laughs> it did say on my jacket, do not trust. Okay. <laughs> Very personable, do not trust. I, 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 it did say that, so um, I always find that amazing that they actually put that on my jacket. Yeah. But anyway, I, I, I think... Uh, yeah, prison. Uh, so prison really blew my mind, I think, and, and in every way because, um, because of the suffering in prison, really. It was, I, I talked about suffering earlier as something that I think really I felt when I was young, and I, I felt it throughout my life, but in a very uh, 
organized way, a continual wave of relentless suffering by everybody inside the prison system just um, really uh, changed my thinking and consciousness about being a human being and, and being alive. Um, so, you know, that's, that's number one. I think we talk a lot about prisons, and I've been in the prison movement for many, many years, and um, there's a lot of reliance on numbers and statistics and what, what is, you know, all of that. And, and really what we have to remember, and, and this is why I wrote the book and why I'm so happy I, I, I can still speak about this, is that every one of those 2.3 million people is a human being, is a person. And it's not a statistic. It's, 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 and that person has a life, and they have a family, and they have their own desires. You know, every single bit of what everybody feels as being a human is completely obliterated by the experience of prison. And I really, I felt that quite acutely in prison. So, I mean, just to answer your question, I, you know, I, 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 from being a woman and understanding the misogyny of the prison system, um, the profound hatred of women who, who uh, step out of line, right? The, the gender normativity and the need for this binary and oppressive uh, set of conditions in American prisons, uh, you know, is just very profound. And then watching, I was in prison through the course of the race war. I mean, I'm sorry, the war on drugs. Um, same thing. Same things. So, um, and, and the drug war, when I first went to federal prison, which was in 1984, um, the population of women was a third black, a third Latin, and a third white. I mean, there was some you know, Latin meaning also people from uh, Central and Latin America. Uh, and that was the numbers of the population breakdown. By the time I left federal prison in 2001, it was 90% African American. And it was, you know, just to witness this, to watch this, when the D.C. prisoners in jails in D.C. all were brought into the federal prison system for the, uh, the, what the drug war had done. It was an incredible experience mm -hmm. to see, to see this number. And so in some ways, going to prison and confirmed everything that I had thought before I went to prison, only now I was in prison, and so the options of what to do about that were so much more limited, right? And so. Um, let's get to Lexington now. I um, saw a film quite a very long time ago called Through the Wire that um, chronicled really the experience of you as well as several others, Sylvia Balladini, Alejandrina Torres, and um, I think one or two others, uh, in this underground unit um, managed by the um, Federal Bureau of Prisons. And I know that um, I used to work in the National Prison Project, but I wasn't there at that time during that suit. But one of the experts that we used to bring through the facilities, um, Dick Corn, he featured prominently throughout the film, and he called it torture. Can you talk to us about this unit that you were sent there, why you and the others were sent there, and um, what they said you had to do if you were ever able to have the possibility of leaving? Yes, I mean, I, I, this brings us to this question about what is the U.S. doing now about torture and using isolation in solitary confinement. And it also brings us to this question of why I put in the title of my book, I am a political prisoner in my own country, um, because I, I was one of a long line of political prisoners in the United States. And so I want to talk about that and come back to, to that. But in terms, of, uh, in terms of Lexington, this is in 1986 and 1987, so this is a really long time ago already, um, where uh, the, the, the Bureau of Prisons, uh, in conjunction with other prison, um, international prison um, systems in Ireland, in, um, in Great Britain, in Germany, in Italy, in France, 
all are beginning to implement what then was called the dead wings, which were the isolation wards for revolutionary prisoners who were captured in each of those countries. The long cash prisoners in Ireland, the people who were in the Irish Republican Army, were kept in these kind of units. Um, and there was, it was very clear that this was a, a strategy to, to break and destroy radical movements um, in Europe, in Western Europe in particular. And the United States didn't quite have that level. Um, it had a different level uh, based on racism and the way that uh, the prison system had has always treated African American and other people of color with solitary confinement and the whole and segregation. But as an organized system, as part and parcel of the actual state and punishment in the paradigm of punishment, there wasn't this system. Um, this organized level. And Lexington was an uh, experiment by the Bureau of Prisons to implement a dead wing prison for political prisoners in the United States. And they thought that they could do it because we were women and we, you know, there would not be support for us and that they would be able to, to do this experiment. It, it began, I was one of the first people sent there uh, with Alejandrina Torres, who is a political prisoner from the Puerto Rican independence movement. And the two of us went there. It was literally a basement in a prison um, that was a federal women's prison. And it was a 16 unit cell, series of cells. Um, and it was all white and the lights were on all the time and nobody could talk to anybody and we had no contact with anybody for 14 months while we were there. And so there were cameras everywhere and there were cameras in the showers and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, in, in some ways it's, it's describing it, it's not as bad as Guantanamo, right? But it was the beginning of what then ends in Guantanamo um, where these conditions exist. And so we were put there because of our beliefs. Um, the three of us who were political women who were incarcerated for our actions against the US but who had been motivated by politics to take these actions, we were all put in this unit. And, uh, and we were told, I mean, there were a lot of things that happened in, in the course of this. and. Uh, but we were told after we'd been there for a short period of time, and I think this is what you're, you're asking me about, is that if we, want, if we would uh, renounce our beliefs, if we would give up information to them about whatever they wanted us to talk about, we would be able to leave that unit. We would be able to get out of the Lexington High Security Unit and we would be able to go to general population. Um, they weren't going to free us, <laughs> they weren't going to let us out of prison, but we could go to, to general population. And, and so th what, when they first said that to us, I, I remember it really, I actually remember it rather vividly. I thought, this is how we can fight them. This is how we can defeat them because they're not supposed to do that in America. I actually believed that, right? That I, I thought, wow, you know, they're torturing us and they're saying to us if we renounce our... So anyway, what happened from there was that um, we spent months trying to get them to put it on paper so that we could sue them and we could take them to court. And so uh, there was a whole huge human rights struggle of which, you know... So you, you did sue them. We did correct? sue them. And I know there was a very brave judge. You want to tell a little bit about Yeah, there was a very, I mean, we did sue them. There was a, a movement. It was one of the early human rights movements for women in prison in, the, in this country. Uh, and it was fought on the basis that they, the Bureau of Prisons was violating our human rights and our First Amendment rights and as a, a place of torture. Uh, so it was very early in this period of trying to expose these kind of things that people didn't believe the United States government did. But we took it to court. The, uh, the National Prison Project of the uh, ACLU uh, litigated this with us, along with many other people. Um, and uh, Amnesty International intervened on our behalf and came and saw the the unit and condemned it. It was the first report that Amnesty had ever written 
about uh, making a condemnation of U.S. human rights violations. It was a joint report on what was happening with us in Lexington and with men in the Marion prison in Illinois. Um, and so we did sue, and this judge who we had, a Barrington Parker, who was an African-American judge in the District of Columbia, um, ruled in our favor and basically said that it, what was happening to us in Lexington was inhumane and uh, was a violation of our First Amendment rights. So we did not win our litigation on the basis that it was torture, but we did win that they had put us there because of our beliefs, not because of something that we had done. And I understand that that unit was, in fact, uh, shut down, but um, unfortunately, Judge Parker's ruling was over overturned. Turned, and, you know, it seems like solitary confinement is the um, order of the day now. As I said before, I will always say the struggle, you know, continues, but that was a really heroic battle that you all waged to illuminate the issues, bring it out to the public eye, uh, and um, uh, get that unit shut down. Sensory deprivation, I mean, you know, you all were sick. I mean, when I saw you, we came to uh, Washington. You no, know, if you're beautiful, you were horrible. I mean, just what? Just talk to us a little bit about some of the health impact of the conditions that you suffered under that type of sensory deprivation, solitary uh, confinement, um, underground cell at Lexington. Well, you know, now I, there is, I'm so happy that there is this movement going on against solitary confinement because solitary confinement is torture. And now it's understood, I think, that after uh, 15 hours or something like that of total isolation, one's brain patterns begin to change, you know, that right away there's an impact of being in solitary confinement. We just got sick. We were really, we were uh, in these conditions for 28 months. Um, and uh, everybody got really sick. One person, we, we all got this kind of uh, white blindness where everything is white and it's illuminated all the time. So all you, you, you see is white. Um, this was a, a, an impact. Um, everybody got sick in one way or another. And I think, you know, we, we spoke and we talked to the experts, the psychiatric expert for the ACLU about our conditions. And one of the things that we said to them, or I said to him, which then became uh, a, whole, a whole kind of piece of this uh, fight we were in with the state, was that I said to him, well, you know, we all, I, have a suicide plan. And um, that was like, that showed. And I, I, I thought it made sense, right? Because I felt that, you know, if, if we were gonna lose our minds from the torture that we were facing, that better to commit suicide as a last act of resistance and a way where we had power to determine our own destiny rather than to um, become totally tortured and destroyed by the state. Because I said that, it, it, you know, it meant that they were trying to kill us. And it was actually, it was very difficult to admit that. I didn't want to admit that because I was supposed to be, you know, a militant and a strong revolutionary. But I also felt like it was the right thing to consider under those conditions. It's, I, I, I know it's hard to understand that, but in any case, that's, that's something that happened. And so there was a real uh, response that what was being done to us this way was um, causing us to uh, be suicidal. And that really, I think, had an, had an impact on the decisions that uh, Barrington Parker made. So Alejandrina Torres had a heart attack while we were in, in that unit. Uh, Sylvia Baraldini uh, got cancer while we were in that unit and then it was luckily was treated outside of that unit. Um, everybody got really, really sick from those conditions. I just want to say one segue back, though, to the other point, which is that out of the resistance and what happened at Lexington and post-Lexington, and I don't think people really know this, even people in the prison movement don't know this that much, is that 
our, the decision on our case was overturned. And what it means now is that the Bureau of Prisons can take a prisoner who's in prison for something relatively minor, and they have complete control over that prisoner and can put them in any prison, in any place, for any length of time, no matter what, with no due process. And so this idea that we have this myth that there's due process in our country, right? When we look at prisoners, there really is almost no due process, right? Mm -hmm. the, the idea that we still have habeas corpus has really been undercut by this, and it happened in prison. So this idea that prisons reflect society at large is really true, right? So if you can do it in prison, you can do it to everybody else. And I think that's something that I really understood in retrospect about the experience of Lexington. So, Susan, there was another indictment, and you and co-defendants yeah, came to Washington, D.C. Yeah, they just never let me DC. alone, you know? They just wouldn't let me alone. Uh, and, and this indictment um, had something to do with um, uh, a number of different bombings, including the bombing at the U.S. Capitol after the invasion of uh, Grenada and a number of other actions. And the indictment said something to the effect of seeking to change the policies and practices of the United States. And the d different things that I saw through some of the documents was that many of these um, uh, actions were in support of liberation movements and um, uh, solidarity. And I just want you to speak about that solidarity with liberation movements as motivation for um, uh, uh, some of the actions and ac activities. Can you just speak a little bit to, to that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Solidarity, I think, is what motivated us as people in the in the left. I was from that part of the movement and came from that that part of the what we called then the anti-imperialist movement. Um, and so solidarity with national liberation struggles was what we were trying to affect, whether that was against the war um, and solidarity with the National Liberation Front in Vietnam, right? We were not just against the war, we were also for the right of the Vietnamese people to take control of Vietnam. Um, so I think for us, we were, and I was, really um, uh, moved and motivated by wanting to support revolutionary struggles around the world and in the United States at the same time. So um, I think for us, uh, we were, and again, I, I said this earlier, I would say it again, I think we were, we, were, we were wishing that there was a revolutionary movement when in fact there really wasn't. But there were still struggles that were going on in the world. Uh, that we wanted to support. Um, and the U.S. did a takeover of a revolution that had happened in Grenada, and um, there was a, finally a response to that. Right, so there were uh, there was central there was a war going on at the time of these actions in Central America uh, that the U.S. was sponsoring and supporting, and so there was actions in support of the people in Central America around that, um, and so that I think. But, you know, more broadly, I would say that I think human solidarity is what makes it worth living. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, solidarity is like the most important concept there is. You know, I'm, I'm an atheist, but what I do believe in more than anything is in human solidarity and that in the human spirit that we can actually feel each other and deal with each other. And, mm -hmm. and so... You know, that might not be exactly what you're asking me, but, mm -hmm. but that's kind of how I, I came away from the experience of prison was that solidarity put me in prison and solidarity saved me from prison, you know, in both ways. Uh, you know, Susan, I remember um, when I met you in the D.C. jail, I was part of the legal defense uh, team. I met you and your co-defendants. You 
do not look like terrorists. <laughs> you know, not one person lost their lives in any of the actions or anything along those lines. I remember, and I probably shouldn't be saying this, okay, but you know, rather than really dealing specifically with the legal strategy and all like that, you all were talking about what are we going to do with Mumia, and you know, what 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 is the strategy to? Uh, and this was in the early days when we, we uh, I didn't really know who Mumia Bujamal was really back then. You all, that, those were the discussions that we were having, discussions about. Uh, uh, making sure that you all would not come into the legal room in shackles and chains, discussions about how are we going to uh, uh, take down the wall. You know, what was this wall that would tell, yeah, the, we tell the folk about, about the wall? The wall. Yeah, well, motion are, to tear down are, the wall. Are the walls now standard? The, the walls are still there. Yeah, it the never wall, got never down, but it was a um, um, it was a, a movement to educate people that you were not terrorists. You did not need to be protected. The, 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 the audience the, coming to the courtroom, did, the judge did not need to be protected you know, from you. So, you know, we spent a good deal of time with that type of education. I don't right. know if you want to say anything about that. Well, I think I was saying it somewhat before, which is that if you can do it to the terrorists, then you can do it to anybody, right? So it's this whole idea of dehumanizing and, and criminalizing people in a major way, and that's what they were doing with us. And so, I, you know, when I was going on trial as a, a as a plaintiff and suing the Bureau of Prisons around Lexington, and I was going to go to court, and I had, you know, I, I hadn't been in a public place in a long time, they put up this wall in the courtroom between the well of the court and the and the spectators, and you know that was the beginning of the kind of repression that now we think of as almost standard, right? But then it had never happened, and there was this plexiglass wall that was erected because I was so dangerous to the population that would be watching the trial. And fortunately, you know, it wasn't totally consolidated at that point. I remember when Barrington Parker. Uh, he, refused. he refused to have his trial in that courtroom, and he was—he said, "This is ridiculous. I'm not going to do that." Mm -hmm. And uh, but now that's what I mean about how it—you know—we were—we knew we were—we felt so strongly that if if we couldn't stop it, then it was going to proliferate, and that's part of why we resisted so strongly was that we really understood that once that kind of level of repression would take hold, it would proliferate in the society as a whole. These were also the days when crack was beginning to hit the streets, the days when um, HIV and AIDS uh, was really, really proliferating. You did a lot of work in that area while you were in prison. I mean, you were one of the main um, AIDS activists. Can you talk a little bit about your experiences along those lines? Well, we were in prison. I was in prison when when uh, the AIDS epidemic of, uh, occurred, uh, started. I mean, um, and uh, and watched the AIDS epidemic happening. And then I was in the, as Nikichi said, I was in, in with my other co-defendants in the D.C. jail. Uh, this is in 1980. 8, 89, and 1990. So this is in when the AIDS epidemic really is, uh, is begins and begins to become larger. Uh, and it was also in a period where um, people were people believed that women couldn't get AIDS. <laughs> I mean, it's almost unbelievable to say that now. But there was a long period in the AIDS epidemic where women were considered vessels of the epidemic, but not trans, could not uh, get that. They could transmit it, but couldn't get it. And while we were in the DC jail, we watched people wasting away from this unknown disease. And it was an incredibly horrifying experience to witness people dying of AIDS. Three women died the first year that I was in, in on my unit in the DC jail. Um, there were nine deaths overall that first year in 1988, and we we were we we just couldn't. We, there was no health care. There was just fear. People were wearing plastic gloves and you know hurting people who were sick. It was just an incredible um, the fear and stigma of a virus that then people really knew almost nothing about, or if they knew, that knowledge wasn't in the prisons. 
So in response to that, it seemed it was such a crisis of such profound pr proportions that we needed to organize. And so because we had some background and one of the defendants in my case was a medical doctor, um, we had a big fight with the administration of the jail to start the first, and I think it was really the first, AIDS education program inside of jail in, in the United States. So, and then we went on. There was this moment where this epidemic hits the prison system, and the prison system nationally has no capacity to deal with it. So they let prisoners, they gave a tiny bit of space for prisoners around the country to organize as peer-to-peer -to, -peer to build AIDS programs. It's a very interesting thing that happened in the, in the prison system, and I was one of those people who was able to do that and then did that in every subsequent prison that I, I was in. But David Gilbert, who is a prisoner in New York State, is uh, I was an actively involved in doing organizing around the HIV AIDS epidemic. Judy Clark and Kathy Boudin did incredible work at Bedford Hills mm -hmm. Prison. Laura and Marilyn, Laura Whitehorn and Marilyn Buck did organizing in California. And there are countless places where prisoners still are trying trying to do organizing now around hep C, mm -hmm. um, the, other, the other related epidemics, because you know it's a misnomer when we're talking about prison to say health care. There is no care, mm -hmm. right? So this is a still a huge issue today. So then you left DC jail and you went to Danbury. Danbury that is the uh, site of the Hollywood production, should we say, Orange is New Black. <laughs> I, I'm going to ask you about that. But first, I know that you also met Kimba Smith there, Kimba, who was serving a 24 and a half year sentence as a first time nonviolent girlfriend of a drug uh, dealer. Um, all this was part of this whole mass incarceration that you talk about that Michelle Alexander writes about in her book, The New uh, Jim Crow. I'm just curious, with the Hollywood paying attention now to prisoners and with our dear friend Piper, and I think she's going to be uh, gracing this stage um, uh, soon, Piper uh, Kerman, um, tell me what you think about um, the series or, or her book um, in, in terms of um, the reality of the situation and whether Hollywood should or should not be. I mean, it's a good thing, is it a bad thing? It, just curious, what's your views? <laughs> okay. Uh, I think the book is really a good book, I, you know, and I think that people should read the book um, because I think one of the things that happens to white people who go to prison is that they get completely challenged about their own racism and what they think about the world and how to deal with that, right? And so what's really... I mean, why I'm talking about solidarity and what I think is so interesting about Piper's experience is that she had her mind blown, too, about the fact that she was had so much solidarity given to her by other people who were in prison, principally who were her, her, her peers in prison who were black women. And that's a really an interesting and important part of that book. And the strains in that book that are very much similar to my own experience, although we had different some different experiences. Um, so yeah, I think um, you know I would I, I think the book is important. I, you know, uh, it's always it, the question of getting our views in the culture and how do we penetrate the culture. Um, you know, is really a, it's a, something that leftists and radicals and movements for social justice and change have been grappling with forever. Um, so we're not, this isn't new. Um, is it infotainment? Is it entertainment? Um, you know, Orange is the New Black, I, as I said, I teach, and all of my students all ask me, you know, well, what do you think of the what do you think of that? Because that's what they've seen and that's what they know. And, uh, you know, unless they have people in their family who've been to prison, right? So it's either people know nothing or they're completely connected to the criminal justice system. It seems less and less there's people in between. Um, so, I, you know, I think, um, I think it's important that there be 
positive stories in the culture about people who are incarcerated. So I'll say that about it on the one hand. So I think in that sense, it's an important thing because it puts the issue of women in prison out there. On the other hand, I, you know, as always, when Hollywood puts its hands on something um, and they've done their market research about what sells and what doesn't and how to tell the narrative or not, I'm very unhappy about the fact that once again, we are shown images that show us the same stereotypes that put forward black women in a way that are derogatory and I think, you know, <gasps> extremely racialized. So I have a big problem with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to be balanced in my, what I'm saying, you know, I'm going really out the distance on it because I, I don't, I, I think overall the book is really important. Um, so, you know, but I think our images, look, there's this whole idea about prisons that, let me just say a little more about this, which is that, you know, prison, I think Angela Davis, who has written a great book that I urge everybody to read, which is called Prisons Are Obsolete, um, which is kind of the primer of prison abolition, um, writes this whole piece about, you know, the prison is this institution on the hill. This, the prison is something that we live with that is both seen and unseen, and that we know about it, it figures prominently in our consciousness, right? Or it's, it, you know, it's the pipeline from one institution in the community right into prison, or it's something that we know nothing about that's kept secret that we shouldn't know about, you know? So I think when images of prison are in the mass culture, it's very important to ensure, and I know that Orange is the New Black is trying to do this, but you know, to make real what prison is. And, and I think that that is, is the problem for me with that show. Okay, I just have about one or two more questions and then I, hopefully we can open it up yeah, with some yeah. Q&A. Um, but you're out of prison now, Sylvia Baldini is out, Alejandrina Torres is out. Are there any more political prisoners or prisoners of war in prison today? Yeah, well, that, I'm glad you asked me that. Yes, there are, I, you know, and I think this is something that, you know, I feel like I'm so lucky that I got out of prison, right? And I could just as easily have been in prison today. I would still be in prison today if I had not gotten clemency from President Clinton. And sometimes I think about that. You know, like what I've been able to do in these 14 years of my life and what I would not have done at all. Um, so I feel very, very privileged and lucky to be able to be out of prison at this point. Um, but there are many, many, many U.S. held political prisoners in the United States still to this day. And now they've been in 30 and 40 years, more than that. And these are people who were from that film, that clip that we saw. That, that seven minute clip, it be, lays the basis for understanding that there are scores and scores of people from that period who are still incarcerated. And I mentioned some of them before, but there are six prisoners in New York State uh, who are all parole eligible, but who were all part of the revolutionary black nationalist movement of the 60s and 70s, who because they are convicted of violent crime are not, will not be given parole. And so there's a big fight going on now in New York State about these prisoners to say, when is it enough punishment? Isn't it, is there never enough punishment for the crimes and the actions, or not even crimes, but the actions and activities that people took when there was a civil conflict going on in the country? Obviously, there's never enough. I mean, there isn't enough because we live in a society that still holds dear the death penalty. So obviously, anything goes as far as punishment is concerned. But yes, I think there's other, there's the MOVE political prisoners. Um, there's Mumia Abu-Jamal. There's Leonard Peltier. There's Oscar Lopez. These are all people who've been in prison for decades who should all be released. 
And there's a new wave of political prisoners, people who come from the environmental movement. And now there's another group of people who are being incarcerated who are the hackers, who are the whistleblowers, right? These are just a whole other group of people. There are always going to be political prisoners because that's the kind of, we live in a world where the political state has to keep control. And if you're outside of that, then you're, you're in big trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, my last question for you, uh, Susan, is basically why is it important, or is it important, to uh, stand up and to speak out? And I ask this because I know that Frederick Douglass once talked about change, and he said if there's no struggle, there's no progress. He said those who profess the favor of freedom yet depreciate agitation or those who want the crops without plowing up the ground. He said that this struggle has to come about because without it, we don't move on. So for you, uh, why is it important? Why do you, why stand up? Why speak up? What do you say to everyone here, what they should be doing? I think we should abolish prisons. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, 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 and I think, I think we can do it. I mean, I actually think, you know, we can, we can do it. We can do it in our lifetime, you know? I, I mean, prison is a crime itself. Right, I think, you know, people don't say that enough. I, look, I am completely in favor of reforming prison. I think we need to reform prison in every way possible as quickly as we can. And because for me, any positive change for the lives of people who are currently incarcerated is something that I want to see happen because I want to see the elimination or the alleviation of people suffering in prison, right? This minute, not tomorrow, this minute. So, you know, on, on that level, I, I think this movement that we're seeing is, is in really important and fantastic. On the other hand, it's also true that until we deconstruct the multiple systems that make up the prison industrial complex, that make up what this system is and who benefits from it and how they benefit from it and how it keeps us in a perpetual war, the relationship between militarism and the prisons, right? The fact that our country is doing what it's doing around the world, all of that is actually can be looked at in the prison industrial complex. And so for me, saying that there's a different way, there's a different way to think about justice. If we think prison has anything to do with justice, we are kidding ourselves. This is a complete myth. It's a complete misnomer. So for me, I, I think it's important to stand up for a human solidarity for making the world a better place, for the fact that you do one thing in your life, you have no idea how it's going to impact down the line. And, you know, I want more good than bad. I mean, I used to want a revolution, and I, in my heart of hearts, I still do, but I also believe that that's really far in a certain way. But I actually think prison abolition can help us rethink and restructure what we believe about what's important in society. So, you know, I guess I, I just think we, we, we need and we want and, and we can have a more socially just world. Susan, all I can say is thank you. You, your story is just so <laughs> vividing, so inspiring. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm always embarrassed. You know, I used to always, call myself an armchair revolutionary, you oh, know? No. But I mean, you know, thank you so much for sharing. I hope there's some questions or some dialogue from the audience. I see a microphone there. If you're interested in asking a question or making a comment, go in and make your way to the microphone. And as we're waiting for people to do that, let me just um, ask you something else. I noticed that um, in your book, you talked about the Joint Terrorist Task Force and one of the uh, persons that was part of the task force at that time, Bernard Carrick, who later became uh, police commissioner uh, in New York under Giuliani. I know he went to prison, and I think it's very interesting. It appears that people who go to prison, no matter where they are in the political spectrum, are touched by 
the conditions are touched by the humanity of the people that they see there. And I've heard them speak on certain cases, and I'm beginning to, is that Bernard Carrick speaking? So you don't have to respond to that. I was just waiting for people to come up. I just saw that as an interesting scenario, and I thought maybe if more conservative white men <laughs> went to prison, maybe we would be far along on that task yeah, of no. abolishing prisons completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. How are you, my brother? I'm doing good. good. Name is Carl Dix, uh, co-founder of the Stop Mass Incarceration Network, representative of Revolutionary Communist Party, just so everybody knows. Okay, going back to some of the comments that uh, Ms. Sackler made opening this up in terms of situating stop, uh, mass incarceration in the abuse that black people have suffered since they dragged the first African here in chains. I mean, that is exactly the case and it is a conscious policy, not just something that happened or black people commit a lot of crimes, but a conscious policy of social control targeting blacks and Latinos. And look, it is built into the fabric and framework of this system, which is why I say two things on it. One is it'll take revolution, nothing less, to get rid of it once and for all. And look, we in the Revolutionary Communist Party, we build in a movement for revolution, and we've even put together a constitution that talks about what a revolutionary society would look like and how things would be different on that. And people really need to engage that. And then the other thing that we say is that people need to stand up and resist this right now. And that's the very heartening thing about what people have been doing around police killings, which kind of concentrate this program of punishment. And we're moving to stand up on April 14th, and I encourage everybody to get with me and talk about that. Now, I wanted to pose to you because- It's a specific question. To Susan, I mean, you can comment on it too, Sounds sister, but I was posing it to Susan because you talked about we can end prisons, abolish prisons in our lifetime but revolution is far off. So I'd actually like you to discuss how we could do that, because it's, I'm with you on a lot of things, but I think we need a revolution to do that, and I'd just like to get your perspective on how we could move towards abolishing prison in a shorter framework. Well, short is good, I agree with you. <laughs> the shorter, the better. I mean, I think, well, you know, it's like when, when I first came out of prison, which is 14 years ago, there was no concept really of abolition in terms of prison, right? I mean, there was critical resistance had been doing certain kind of work. Um, and um, I think Angela Davis's book uh, about the prison industrial complex and prison abolition came out in 2002, I think, or some, somewhere along that line. I mean. The, the level of discussion and action around abolition as a concept and an, as something potentially real is so much broader than it, it, than it was even 10 years ago. It's a, at least, it's not something that people just immediately say, oh, absolutely not. I mean, because nobody is talking about abolition in the sense that, you know, um, there isn't a form of justice it's not to it's not to say that if we had prison abolition there wouldn't be justice no it's more about what would community control look like what would how would we be able to organize the society in such a way what would we do in the schools in order to prevent prison so i think there's there's many components to it because it is this series of interlocking systems so i you know i I know that's not exactly an answer to your question, but it's part of an answer. And Carl, I'll just say also, um, a, a keen to that, people are really beginning to look at law enforcement now as well, particularly in the wake of you know, all the incidents that have recently occurred. People are really seriously looking about not specifically law enforcement reform, but law enforcement restructuring. So I like to look at that in context with this whole concept of making prison abolition a reality um, as well and see how the two of those can work in tandem because people don't get in prison unless the police put them there. So that's a great question. 
hopefully everybody will um, partake in the activities that you've been um, at the helm of for so very long. Thank you. Thank you for. Thank you. Uh, I have two microphones. I thank you. Yes, I, you do. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. My name is Sheila Katzman. I'm the chair for Cities for the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and Girls. And it and just came up on this thing happening here today. We came for something else. Uh, my first question is, um, President Clinton Grant clemency to you. Um, were there any black revolutionaries included in that? Because for some unknown reason, I don't know why Jews are always seen as considered white. I, I, I don't know why that is. And could you answer that question? You know, who else were um, granted clemency? And the other question is more personal because I'm sitting there and I'm, I don't, con I don't know if I'm a revolutionary. I stand for change and justice and worked in some really hardcore place of, places of war around the world. Um, you said, as a revolutionary, you didn't mind dying for the cause, which most of us maybe feel that way too. And prison is another thing, but what really was heart-wrenching for me is you never realized until you're there what prison life was like and the bit of the light and the, the torture that you went through that, that pain, I think, was felt by everybody coming through here. So it, it drives a certain kind of fear, had you known, but we never know what will happen when we're fighting, for, fighting against injustice. What, 14 years now, um, what was it like? What did you do to normalize yourself psychologically and I asked that because I worked in peacekeeping operations and even I'm still traumatized nine years after you know by there's some triggers that happen that really make me into something that I'm not or don't want to be thanks thank you well wow, that yeah you asked uh, several questions so I think I'll take the last one first. Um, yeah, I, I, well, when I was in prison, I felt that we were being tortured in this unit. And um, we didn't really want to say at the time we were being tortured. For some reason, we felt like if we admitted that we were being tortured, that then it would, there would be more success of their ability to torture us. I'm not sure why we thought that, but so, but I, in my mind, I really thought that what was happening to us was torture and that if I ever could get out of prison, which at the time I did not know or have much of an expectation of, that I would go to a torture clinic if I ever could get out. And when I got out, I did. And I went to the NYU clinic, uh, torture clinic. And I went there because I felt like I had been very severely damaged by the experience. And because I uh, wanted to go to a place where I wouldn't have to explain about being political. Like, I wouldn't have to prove that I hadn't made all of these things up about how I was treated. And so it was really important to recognize the psychological impact. And I think about that in relationship to people coming out now. You know, all the hundreds of people who haven't been tortured in the same way, but prison is so traumatizing to people that there is a need for serious psychological stuff that has to take place for people in order for people to come out and be reclaim their their sanity and their humanity. So, um, I you know I think I did many things, but because I was conscious that there had been such a deep impact, it gave me the tools to be able to at least try and get some healing going. Um, in, in terms of your other question, um, President Clinton was uh, released on clemency in those clemencies. Uh, he 
pardoned, gave clemency to a number of Puerto Rican political prisoners. There were 11 political prisoners that were in that same period released uh, under a clemency. And uh, there were drug war prisoners. But in terms of African American or new African political prisoners, there were none given clemency. And Leonard Peltier, who was up for clemency, was at the very last minute denied clemency. And you know, I, I think I said this earlier, but I think that you know, this is a question also of where in the privilege exists in every sphere. And in this, it existed as well, you know, and I, 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 I feel that about my, my clemency. Okay, let's go to the next question. Hi everyone, my name is Jenny and I'm with the People's Power Assemblies, um, which is a group here in New York City um, that has been organizing a lot of the protests, demonstrations, action, direct actions against police brutality since the um, killing of Eric Garner last year. And we are organizing a People's Tribunal um, later this summer, um, which because of the fact that the justice system, the so-called justice system has Failed, and um, the the goal is to put the police on trial and let the people judge. And we will have an opening session to this people tri people's tribunal, which is taking place um, April second, so in about two weeks, at the National Black Theater in Harlem, um, from six to nine p.m. And I have these yellow flyers, which I can pass out to you, but they're also outside on the table. And in a, I invite you all to come. There will be testimonies by people affected by police brutality, but um, the name is the People's Tribunal on Police Violence and Structural Racism because we really want to emphasize that this is part of a larger system um, of structural racism, that it's not just the police, that we don't just need to reform police practices, but we really have to abolish prisons. We have to overhaul um, the whole system. So I would um, invite you all to join us. Um, as I said, there will be um, testimonies, there will be a town hall where people can participate and a few um, speeches by people affected. Um, so please feel free to grab these flyers and um, come see me if you have any questions. Thank okay. you. Thank and you, thank for you your so comment. much for the, for the talks. Um, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Let's go to the next question on this side. Hello. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. My name is Alexis Haney. I'm not with any group. I'm a college student in the City University of New York. And what I have is more of a concern than a question, because whenever I approach a space that is designated, um, as the flyer says, for people of color, and there's a white body as the presenter, I, I get a little concerned. And I want to know, you addressed in a lot of passing about, oh, and also, the black women there and also my experience of their experiences, but when you put your, your face in the front or you use a voice like Angela Davis, um, how do you address the, the audience when you're, you're basically repackaging someone else's experience? You're repurposing in a way that is easier to access for a lot of people. And I think about the, you use Piper Kerman's show and I think about who can afford to not know about prison? Like, where do you have to be in life to not, to only, your only experience of prison is a TV show. And even that show, the only experience is through a white woman's experience of prison. What, there, there won't, there would never be a show where there's a black woman's experience of prison. And I wanna know just your thoughts on that or how you would work to maybe address that because it felt very uncomfortable for me and for I would feel a lot of black bodies in a space when you're speaking on something that is so immediate to their lives and it's coming from someone who, although it has been a part of your experience, when it's repurposed through you, the white bodies in the audience can access it through something, through a distance. They don't have to actually see it. The way kids can watch Piper Cameron's experience of prison and then the black people rotate in the background. And you say that you are a revolutionary, and what's really revolutionary about a white woman speaking about being a revolutionary? Okay. Go for it, Susan. That's a, yeah. <laughs> I, listen, I feel very acutely aware of this. Um, thank you for the question, um, actually, because I, I guess I would, I would say 
that I didn't want to write this book for that very reason, because the, the reality is that American society can only access things through the eyes or the people that they have in common with. So it is through my white eyes that this experience and how I have experienced what I have has been, has been um, written. And um, I, I, actually, I actually agree with you. I don't really do this very much because there is a part of me that feels very strongly that, um, that there, it, it, is, it is primarily um, not my role to do that. But on the other hand, I did have this experience. And if people can access some of the incredibly destructive issues that prison and prison life and the experience of prison raises, then I, I think it's worth it. And, you know, I think it's a good thing. So, um, yeah, I, that's, that would be, would be my answer. I don't feel that I'm repurposing or repackaging Angela Davis. I feel that as another person in the prison struggle, and there are many, many people in the prison struggle, um, more and more voices like mine, like Angela's, like anybody who's coming out of prison um, who embrace this idea of abolition is how you build a movement. And it's going to take a lot of different people to build that movement. But I, I, I really I respect your question. And I also say that um, many times the majority culture feels and accepts things more so when it comes from people who look like them. Um, that's one of the things I found um, throughout. That's one of the reasons why um, Piper Kerman's book and her film has been so very successful. I work in Washington and the legislators um, saying, you know, can we get Piper Kerman on, on the panel? You know, it, it serves to help to illuminate issues in cases where it's otherwise swept under the rug. What we really want to do is for people to also lift up other books, other cases. Kimba Smith has a book out called Poster Child. She is one of the drug war persons that Susan spoke about who was granted clemency. Asada Shakur, who um, also was a political prisoner, prisoner of war, who was granted exile and is living in Cuba, has a uh, book. Of course, Angela Davis has books. They're different things for different environments, I guess you could say. But everyone's talking about basically the same central um, issue and same central concern, just everybody's ears are not receptive. They're receptive based on who the messenger uh, is. And Susan, being the messenger, has been able to um, uh, go into certain areas and break down barriers where Asada Shakur might not have been able to. So I appreciate the question as well. So we're going to, uh, I forgot which side we're on, this side, yes. Hi, my name is Chad Kautzer. Um, I'm a philosophy professor in uh, Denver and had a chance uh, about 10 years ago to interview Angela Davis about organizing. And um, I was still a student at the time, and it was a very influential interview for me because it was for Abolition Democracy, her book, Abolition Democracy. And she said, you know, the way I was asking the questions, she said, you know, at the time, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, you know, we had an analysis of the state and of power and of racism, but in terms of organizing, we didn't really know. In retrospect, it looks like we knew what we were doing uh, because we were pretty successful at gaining attention and growing, but at the time we really didn't know what we were doing. And so it's really important for every generation to experiment in organizing. And that just changed my whole world to think about that. Um, and this is in connection to the, the last question because I think it's really important and this is the uh, question I want to address to you both, which is I think it's really important for white people to speak out and challenge white supremacy. Um, actually, I think it's an obligation of white people to challenge white supremacy. So I think it's really important that white people speak out, not speak for, but speak out against white supremacy. And it was that encounter with Angela Davis that made me think about that. And so for the last 10 or 11 years, I've been speaking out and teaching and writing about white supremacy and, and um, criticizing state policies that support it. And I guess my question to you both is, for those uh, who are listening to this, um, who are exposed to this, who are 
not experienced organizers. They're not self-defining as revolutionaries. They're, all of this is just overwhelming to them. And sometimes it seems like everyone's got an inside track somehow and they don't know how it's even possible to get involved um, or they're scared to get involved. What kind of advice would either of you or both of you give to young folks who know something's wrong and they want to get involved of things that they can do, uh, places that they can go, books that they can read, such as yours, Susan, um, to get them connected and thinking about this stuff in ways that are really practical and every day. Because sometimes when we look back at these movements, um, and I know my students look at Black Lives Matter often as this movement that's over there and not happening right in their community, even though it is happening right in their community. Um, how to make that connection to get them from being interested in observing and to participating in uh, social struggles. And thank you again for being here, it's fantastic. Thank you. You know, it's funny, I, I always, I feel like, well, you know, I wrote the book, right? And so I, I, I don't have a program for, for, for social revolution, right? I just wanted to start a conversation. So I don't really, I don't have a really great answer to that. I, it, but what I, what I do think is, I think every person needs to become immediately involved with prison and prison work in one form or another and protest of how policing and criminal justice happens. And there are lots of ways to do that. There are multiple organizations that are doing work around this. I mean, there's from the lowest level to a much more militant level. You know, it's like you can be a pen pal for somebody in prison if, if, if that's the level that first takes you into this world, if you're not already in this world. Um, there's, I mean, there's just a, a range of things. So I, I don't really, I don't have, I'm not, I don't have like a specific program um, that I, that I'm pushing in this. I'm and I don't have the answer either, but I will say, going back to a slogan from the past, agitate, educate, organize. How are we going to make the black nation rise? Educate, educate, organize. Mm -hmm. but, but I say that to say there are a lot of people who are on the streets um, now with the uh, hands up movement, et cetera, and doing die-ins and all of that. And that is absolutely excellent. I mean, that's part of being part of the movement, part of being part of the struggle, that's part of the agitation. But you gotta educate yourselves as well. The books that we're talking about, there's the two others that I forgot since we're gonna lift up the black folk who have written books too. Jamal Joseph, who was um, featured in the Stanley Nelson Panthers of the vanguard of the movement. He has a book called Panther Baby, Baby. Panther Baby, I think it is. Safia Bukhari, like um, longstanding um, um, the former political prisoner, prisoner of war, who has since uh, passed. Um, there is a book out um, you know, uh, about her. So we need to educate ourselves to what's out there. We need to learn it ourselves, and we need to pass on uh, the information. And then we need to organize. We need to find organizations who are out there doing things that organizing folk who were just up at the podium and diets talking about um, um, rallies and demonstrations and, 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 and tribunals and things that they're organizing. We need to be a part of all of that. And as we become part of the movement, the movement can um, go on. We actually have, I think we have about 10 minutes. Is that correct? We have about 10 minutes. I think we have a couple more questions. Um, so let us know who you are. Hi, I'm Corinna. Um, I'm a college student at Bard College, and you'll have to forgive me if this question is a little bit grounded in pop culture, but um, I wanted to know how you feel about um, the topic of Norwegian prisons that have been really popular in the press and the idea of open prisons where prisoners have a very fluid life with the community and are able to see their families and have, I guess, as much autonomy as one could imagine in a prison. Um, but I was wondering if you think that those are maybe a step in the right direction or counter to your ideas of what justice means. So if you could just say a little bit about how you feel about that. Uh, I'm not aware of that. <laughs> you that the region prisons. I, I, I you know, it. I think, look, I think that the fact that they have a view that people should maintain relations, that prison shouldn't be, um, you know, only punitive, right? That they have a rehabilitative view of prisons is is nicer. <laughs> I, I'm not sure it's significantly better, but it certainly means it's less um, 
egregious to the, to the people. They don't have the death penalty in Norway, and they don't have uh, life sentences. And so in that regard, I think it's really important as, uh, you know, another, that there are other examples out there of c criminal justice that uh, don't contain the same things that the system here does in, on that level, but on another level, you know, I think it's, I, I really do think we need to think harder about what kind of justice do we want to see? What kind, what is transformative justice? What is another way of looking at punishment? Why do we have crime to begin with? I mean, I think we have to get it to it at a deeper, at a deeper level. And actually, I really appreciate your question because I don't know much about Norwegian um, prisons, but this is what I'm talking about when we say educate us, ourselves. You have put it out there. I'm going to go and do the research and background so I can be articulated on, on that and next time. And just before we bring up the, the last um, uh, commenter or questioner, you know, the United States, Susan, is, you know, has the highest incarceration rate in the world, a 500% increase over the past you know, 15 or 20 years. And these excessive sentences is really what's driving this. The sentence you got 58 years for a possession mm -hmm. charge. I mean, a 58 years, uh, Kimber Smith, 24 years for a nonviolent first time. I mean, the sentences that are being meted out in this country are just absolutely deplorable. And if anybody wants to organize about something also, do something about the, these sentences are becoming the new norm. Yeah, they are. And, you know, it's really, I'm curious what's led to this mass incarceration, this carceral. And, state. you know, in conjunction with that, it's, there's, this, there's this idea that our system is, it has this uh, sort of relief in it, which is about parole but people are not getting parole either, right? So then really it's just a continual punishment. You know, it's like continual war, it's continual punishment. So people in New York State, there are 8,000 prisoners in New York State who are over 55. Every single one of them are eligible for parole, but because a number of them have are inside prison for having committed, quote, violent crimes, they won't be released. So really, they have life sentences. The judge didn't say they had life sentences, but in effect, that's what's happening. So there's this lengthy sentencing that's going on, and there's just a complete continuing acceptance of increasing repression. Why do we accept? the fact that there's increasing punitive measures every day. And I think that's a place where we also have to start. Like, why are we accepting it? Okay. Thank you. You have the last question or comment for the Thank evening. you. Howard Katzman. Uh, yeah, I feel very removed from this whole thing in the sense of understanding the prisons thing, prison issues and things like that, but then like the people who are not directly connected to people in prison, to the prison, you know, that whole class type of thing. So you say, hmm. Now on the other hand, when, you when I hear the descriptions of people in prison and the life in prison, I hear this power story, the story of violence, the way um, the violence of the state being used upon people and then people using, trying to use violence back and violence working against them. And what I hear is very much the theories of Gene Sharp talking about nonviolent stru struggle, which had been used very successfully in a lot of these revolutions around the world, like the Egyptian and, um, what was it, Serbian, these different revolutions. And it's like, hmm, the model sounds very similar to what's happening in prison, where the prisoners are made, created a sort of violence that they act out on each other, divide and conquer, and all these other things. But the truth of the matter is the state has the monopoly on violence. And all those just, it just seems to describe that thing very well and as a means of organizing and breaking those down and directing where things are actually coming from to look at the writings of Gene Sharp. Anyway, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I don't know that writer. Okay. So I really want um, everyone to give Susan Rosenberg a big hand. An American radical. Thank you. Thank you. My own country. Thank you. I really want to thank Elizabeth Sackler in thank the you. museum. And I'm going to turn it over to you, well, Elizabeth, to close us out. I, I will close you out. There are a few things I do want to say before I do. I guess 
I have the option to do that because I stand here and there's a microphone for me. All right. Uh, books, the new press. The new press has published 61 books uh, about incarceration. Um, Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy, if you think you know everything that's horrible, learn some more. Uh, so there are a lot of books out there right now, uh, including, of course, um, the great new, the new Jim Crow.